Mr. President, let, my, let me first thank uh, my friend from Alaska for his enthusiasm for getting the Coast Guard legislation completed as a fellow ocean state, albeit a somewhat smaller ocean state. We are strong supporters of our Coast Guard and appreciate very much their uh, service on our waters. I am here for my 189th Time to Wake Up speech to discuss the Republican tax bill. Who knew? Folks watching today's debate from home are probably wondering what the tax bill has to do with climate change. Good question. They might also ask, as I do, why the tax bill includes massive giveaways to fossil fuel producers? Or what opening up precious wilderness to oil drilling has to do with tax reform? The chairman of the Senate Finance Committee said, we need a simpler tax code that puts more money back into the pockets of workers and families. Republicans, he said, want to create a fairer, more predictable system for taxpayers across the country. Mr. President, the tax plan is none of those things. Its benefits are weighted heavily to big corporations, not workers and families, and the corporate tax cuts are permanent. While the modest breaks for some workers disappear after a few years, what is fair or predictable about that? The chairman also once said, I want a bipartisan process that renders a bipartisan result. I think we need a vigorous and open debate in the Senate, which in my view should include a full process in committee and regular order on the Senate floor. Well, we got none of that. Republicans have rammed this bill through using every procedural and parliamentary trick at their disposal as a purely partisan measure, in the dead of night, producing amendments in handwritten chicken scratch in the margins of the bill at the last minute. If we were to ask middle-class families their top priorities for fixing our tax system, I don't think very many would say, you know, what we really need to do is let oil pump companies pump crude in an Alaskan wildlife refuge. But that's what they do. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1960 to preserve unique wildlife, wilderness, and recreational values. It now encompasses almost 20 million acres, with around 8 million acres designated as wilderness. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manages the refuge, which is roadless, trailless, and represents the best of wild Alaska in a world where wilderness is increasingly scarce and vanishing far too fast. The Republican tax bill opens the refuge's 1.5 million acre coastal plain to the oil drillers. Opening the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to oil and gas development does little to provide energy security. The oil producing potential of the area is estimated by the U.S. Geological Survey at a maximum around 12 billion barrels total, total, of recoverable oil. In 2016, the U.S. consumed 7.2 billion barrels of petroleum products just in that year. So all the oil we get from the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which will take decades represents less than two years of current consumption. And that's according to the most optimistic estimate. The budget resolution required that this venture raise a billion dollars over 10 years. Republicans need that billion dollars to fund the big tax cuts that they're giving out to the wealthy and to big corporations. When the numbers were finally crunched, though, Drilling in that Arctic coastal plain couldn't produce those numbers. Did this reality dissuade my Republican colleagues? No. 
Instead, they proposed to make up the difference by sell selling off 7 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, the United States emergency supply of crude oil that actually does help guarantee our energy security. They want to sell reserve oil to fund those cuts for the wealthy and the big corporations. Well, an auction last week of oil and gas leases in another part of northern Alaska bodes ill for Republican hopes about drilling in the wilderness preserve. On 900 tracts of land offered up to oil and gas companies, the Bureau of Land Management fielded just seven bids. 900 tracts of land, seven bids. Why is that? Well, for one thing, low prices for crude oil make the prospect of exploring undeveloped Alaskan wilderness less appealing. In general, current industry appetite for high-risk frontier exploration is very low, observed an energy analyst at Raymond James and Associates. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge would suffer from much the same thing. The second problem is that Oil companies are likely overstating their achievable existing reserves already. They will have to leave a lot in the ground of what they are now claiming as reserves. Buying more when you can't sell what you already have is not a great strategy. Low-cost renewables and excess supply will further drive oil prices down and down if laws of supply and demand hold true. This may be one reason why the World Bank just announced in this news story dated two days ago that the World Bank will end its financial support for oil and gas exploration within the next two years in response to the growing threat posed by climate change. That's where they're going. We are going the wrong way. The sad irony of Arctic drilling is that the American Arctic will feel the effects of burning fossil fuels most severely. The U.S. Global Change Research Program Climate Science Special Report authored by scientists and experts from top universities and across the federal government, found that while all regions of the United States will see significant warming by the end of the century, Alaska is expected to take the hardest hit, potentially over 12 degrees Fahrenheit warmer by 2100, under the high emission scenario shown down here at the bottom right. The northern edge of Alaska, including the historic whale hunting village of Utkiagvik, and please forgive me, Utkiagvikians, for mangling your village's name, um, could see temperature increases of 18 degrees Fahrenheit. 18 degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature. This village, only about 300 miles west of the area in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge targeted for oil and gas development, is already seeing its coastlines overrun by rising seas, its permafrost melting beneath its buildings, and its beaches washing out to sea in strong winter storms as the protective shoreline sea ice forms later and later each year. Here's another news flash from Utkiagvik. 320 miles north of the Arctic Circle, a weather station in America's northernmost city of Utkiagvik has been collecting temperature data since the 1920s. Well, just recently, the average temperature went so off the charts at the weather station there that the instrumentation shut down the recording. 
because it thought something, the algorithm that monitors this figured that something must have gone wrong with the instrumentation because the numbers were so out of whack. Well, the numbers were not out of whack. It was actually very real climate change that changed the environment and sent that signal that blew through the algorithm that the scientists had set up. But in this building, in this room, the warnings of our best scientists about the consequences of our carbon emissions, they just don't count here. The hyped economics about oil drilling don't count here. The weird budgetary jujitsu required to shoehorn this environmental hit into a tax bill doesn't matter here. What matters here is that the oil companies want to drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And so Republicans are making it happen. Republicans claim to be cleaning up the tax code, but their so-called tax reform leaves in place most of the oil and tax giveaways that have benefited that industry for decades. The big oil giants like BP, Shell, ExxonMobil, Chevron, and ConocoPhillips have enjoyed nearly a trillion dollars in profits over the past 10 years. Yes, let's rush to their assistance. Never mind the beleaguered American families, many of whose taxes will go up from this bill. Let's rush to the defense of those companies with a trillion dollars in profits over the past 10 years. They continue to benefit from multi-billion dollar tax subsidies. I'm proud to have repeatedly co-sponsored Senator Menendez's bill that would close the loopholes for the big oil giants, saving $22 billion for taxpayers and debt holders over the next decade. The Republican bill not only leaves most of the old loopholes in place, it offers new giveaways to the oil and gas industry. A last minute change scribbled in during the Senate voterama will allow traded oil and gas partnerships to use the so-called pass-through loophole that Republicans claim is designed to help small businesses. While the Republican tax plan boosts the fossil fuel polluters with this new tax gift, it singles out renewable energy to undermine those jobs. The way this works is that under the historic bipartisan agreement that many of us worked on in 2015, developers of new wind energy were given a period in which tax credits for projects for which construction begins by the end of 2019 would be protected. There was a bargain struck in this body we came together and we agreed on a bipartisan result. This tax bill breaks that deal and breaks that result for wind and for solar. For the wind, it was to the end of 2019. For solar, it was through 2021. These tax credits have been vital to the growth of the re renewable industry across the country. It's grown in red states and blue states. In fact, the five states that get the largest percentage of their electricity from wind and have all those wind energy jobs are Iowa, Kansas, South Dakota, Oklahoma, and North Dakota. And then Texas produces the most wind power of any state. The Republican tax bill is likely to upend the progress we've made on renewables, disrupt ongoing projects, ruin those jobs, all with clever provisions whose trick is to render those renewable tax credits that we bargained for practically valueless. Renewable developers don't usually turn a profit in the early years. So they don't have taxes against which to apply the tax credits. 
So they sell the tax credits to others, and they use the revenue from selling the tax credits to support those wind and solar investments. The clever fossil fuel trick in the Senate bill, specifically the corporate AMT and base erosion so-called provisions, make these credits worthless to the businesses that have been buying them. With no buyers for the tax credits, funds for new wind and solar projects will dry up. And there's even more nonsense in the House bill that takes direct aim at the wind and solar credits, including changing the rules on how projects would qualify for the credits, not just in the future, but also retroactively. They go back to undo deals that have already been done. $20 billion in projects have frozen up, developers say, just from the threat of these changes. Renewable energy industry organizations, including the American Wind Energy Association, the American Council on Renewable Energy, the American Conservation Coalition, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions, the Conservative Energy Network, and Conservatives for Clean Energy all warn that the tax bill would jeopardize growth and jobs in wind and solar projects. If these provisions are retained, the groups wrote to senators, they will result in broad instability and uncertainty for businesses and investors across many sectors, including the clean energy sector. Gosh, I hope my Republican friends will listen to our wind and solar producers, particularly the ones in their home states. I hope they'll listen to the people who are counting on the jobs of those $20 billion in projects that have now been put on the shelf. I hope that they'll listen to American taxpayers who are sick of midnight deal corporate welfare like this. If they do listen, they can scrap this terrible bill. They can sit down and work with Democrats, be a novelty, but we'd welcome it. And we could do a bipartisan tax bill that works for the middle class, for the economy, and for the environment. But with the oil and gas industry calling the shots around here, fat chance of that. I yield the floor.